Hello, I'm Ariel Schoenberg. I'm the executive director of the Delaware Valley Arts Alliance. It's good to be with you here uh, on the balcony of UVA as it starts to get a spring shower. So glad we decided to do this under the porch. Uh, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk about public art. Public art uh, is really one of the most exciting uh, arenas that I think an artist can work in. Uh, it brings in so many different aspects of the artistic practice, from the artist's vision, uh, to use of materials, to community engagement, uh, to civic, social, political, and cultural issues that it can address um, uh, with its installation. Uh, here in Sullivan County, uh, we're fortunate to have a, a wide range of public artworks, from sculptures to wall murals, uh, to temporary and permanent installations. Uh, here in Narrowsburg, uh, we have the honeybee uh, mural from uh, by artist Matt Wiley, whose experience of creating it here in Narrowsburg uh, led him to becoming one of our, our town's most recent additions. And uh, you know, one of the things that has stood out to me about this mural uh, is the way that uh, it really serves to reflect and uh, declare our community's values. Public art is often the very first work of art that many of us come into contact with before, long before entering a museum or visiting an art gallery or visiting a sculpture field. It, that statue that might have been your jungle gym was intended to commemorate a historic moment or celebrate a, a founder of a community or honor a particular citizen who had contributed greatly. Uh, but as a kid, that was your swinging bars or that was your climbing gym. Uh, public art also is has a great ability to allow us to appreciate the landscape and see the landscape anew in partnership with the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency, the Delaware Valley Arts Alliance is proud to be the regranting organization for Sullivan County. And through our community arts grants, we are able to support numerous public art projects. With grants of up to $3,500, we are able to support artist fees, production costs, and marketing relating to community art projects and welcome them from artists and organizations and partnerships throughout the county. The Community Tapestry, which was curated by artist Lori Kuzda and uh, has been on view in a number of public places throughout uh, the region, uh, throughout the Upper Delaware Valley, uh, most recently at the Cooper Ridge Project. And it is a um, public work of art that is temporary. Uh, it is composed of three foot by six foot panels that are hung together, forming one large community tapestry, each featuring the individual artistic expressions uh, regarding uh, our feelings towards the community, uh, the current moment we're in, uh, as we all navigate uh, these uncertain times amidst COVID-19, as well as uh, the um, under, deeper and uh, more understood uh, awareness to social injustice issues that are taking place. So this is a, a work that is being shared with the public. It's intended really to be seen uh, from the street, and it is an opportunity to bring a lot of voices together into uh, a single experience, and uh, I hope you'll come and see it. So my name's Todd Lance. Um, I been doing sculpture for a long time. <laughs> um, I worked most of my career as a sculptural technician, doing work for other people, taking their ideas and creating them, using uh, materials that will make them last forever as opposed to what they bring me, which would be made out of clay or a wood carving or something like that. I make molds and cast them uh, in a permanent material and 
that can be made in reproductions. The public art is good for building a community or what's called place making, um, which I think is a really cool term just to sort of, I think it gives people something to identify with, not only themselves, but to have in common with each other. Um, it's like a, a landmark. Um, it's maybe something to look forward to on your drive to work. You're going by and you see the sculpture every day, or you know, you have your family around. Maybe they're visit your family's visiting or friends visiting. It's like kind of show it off a little, maybe like, oh yeah, we have a lot of public art. There's a lot of art around here or artists, and, and people think that's a good thing. You know, public art is the best way to do that. I mean, like, you could have it in a museum, but then it's only going to be seen by the people that go to the museum. And maybe, you know, people, and only people that know that they respond to other people's artwork. When it's out in the public, you might introduce someone to the whole concept of exchanging ideas without using words um, and you know in this particular case with the butterfly to tie it in with something um, like pollinators the monarch um, and even using like the in interactive uh, signs to explain like what's happening in, in say the butterfly garden at the same time you know here's the sculpture it just brings more awareness to that greater idea that you know pollinators need as much help as they can get right now but i think the the community aspect really appeals to me. The idea that somehow me enjoying something and someone else enjoying that same thing, even though we might not interact with each other, we've somehow made a connection. And I think that's a special contribution. My name is Julia Fell, and I'm the assistant curator here at the Museum at Bethel Woods. You'll see behind me our current outdoor photography installation entitled Earth in Focus, a celebration of our dynamic planet. We're really uh, thrilled to have this outdoor public art installation here on our campus this year. We installed it as a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the first Earth Day, which took place in 1970. In addition to commemorating this really important movement, which stems from the 1960s time period that we focus on here at the museum, we are really excited to be able to offer this as a free to the public art installation that complements our historic landscape. The Museum at Bethel Woods, as part of Bethel Woods Center for the Arts, supports the mission of inspiring, empowering, and educating individuals through, through the arts and humanities. And to follow this mission, we're really excited to be able to offer public art to our visitors. We welcome our visitors to come explore our historic grounds, which are open during regular museum hours, seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. You can explore our plaza here, where our Earth and Focus is currently installed, as well as taking a trip down to our historic Bindi Bazaar trails across Herd Road from the museum. As well as our public art offerings, which are free to the public on our historic grounds, we're also offering a new multimedia augmented reality tour of our historic site which can be purchased from our box office, $5 with a museum ticket or $8 alone. We're standing here in the Bindi Bazaar on our restored trail system, right across the Herd Road from the museum building. Um, what you see behind me is one part of our installation. It's called Crochet Connections Embracing Bindi. It's by an artist called Carol Hummel, who was one of the originators of the art form called yarn bombing. We chose to do this installation at this site-specific location here in our Bindi Bazaar woods 
because it complements the history of our historic site. The Bindi Bazaar was the site of many vendors during the Woodstock Festival in 1969, and some of those vendors were selling textile products. They felt that the yarn installation really helped to reflect the textiles that were sold here, and the colorful, whimsical installations also helped to reflect the attitudes and atmosphere of the Bindi Bazaar and the Woodstock Festival at large. By integrating art throughout the historic spaces of the grounds, what we really are encouraging is visitors who come, both to see the museum and visitors who come for performances, can have like a longer stay or more opportunity to experience the site and to see things that maybe they're not coming for, but are, but make their visit so much better. Hi, uh, my name is James Pislin. I'm, uh, uh, I'm one of the workers here at Circle Park um, in Glens Bay. Uh, we've worked on the park now for about 16 years. Um, the park was built in uh, memory of my daughter who passed away. The um, whole town, they got together and they built a beautiful park. They donated their time, they donated resources, materials. Some of the stuff that I've done is uh, I was a police officer for 27 years, 29 years. And uh, I wound up with Parkinson's disease when I was 38 years old. Um, I had built, originally I had built a lot of the stuff down there. I designed and, and made uh, round picnic tables because it, it just, a round table brings people closer. Um, so that that's where that came from. And, uh, uh, of course, I was overwhelmed because I had so much stuff to do. So I started bringing these kids, knowing that I couldn't do this forever, and with Parkinson's, it's going to get worse and worse. Um, I decided to have some of the high school kids come up and help me, and uh, I would show them how to use the, the tools, and uh, and then they were very eager. They, it was. It was funny. They were all willing to donate their time and their weekend because um, now we're getting to the point in the park where there's there's some stuff that is has uh, deteriorated and has to be redone. And so now I'm basically a supervisor. I come out and uh, the kids show up. Uh, they start taking stuff apart that has to be done and they, they paint and cut new pieces and um, Keep, keep the park stuff looking great. And we went to an amusement park uh, about a month and a half before my daughter passed away. And I spent all this money to take her to an amusement park with her family. And uh, they had a mini golf at the campground. And we came back one afternoon and the kid, she came running up and said, hey, can we go play mini golf? So of course she got all her cousins together and. <laughs> Her family and and we went and played mini golf. It was just a little putt putt course. I mean, there was nothing really to it. And uh, she came back and she, she told me, "Dad, I loved it. I, I had such a good time." And she she said, "Just being with the family and and competing." And so when I came back, we decided that we we're gonna <laughs> somehow build a mini golf course on a hill. It was just a very rewarding thing to have uh, these kids show up and help out and use the stuff that they learned to help fix stuff. My name is Ron Meyer and I'm uh, with Circle Park. Uh, we're here in Lumberland. Um, I, I attended some of the first meetings and got involved uh, with, uh, with the group. And um, there was there was quite a few ladies that were involved, and and they seemed to be the the core. Uh, they they did a lot of the background work in in terms of uh, 
securing this piece of property, which is owned by the town, but securing it for the park. And um, they were also instrumental in, in obtaining funding. Um, there were guys too, but the guys, the guys did more of the hands-on work. They did, they did a lot of the background. They did a lot of brains, the brains behind the, the brains behind the project. Um, we started out with uh, a concept, very small, and as the funding increased, we got some some funding from Renaissance. We got some funding from uh, some of the local representatives, assembly assembly people. Um, senators and so on uh which which was phenomenal and this basically jump-started me into being much more active in, in in the community and uh i met a lot of people and um the, the people were, were very enthusiastic and i was i was surprised the town is small we have, we have a, a, a fairly low population in the town and um there were some weekends where we had 60 people show up obviously this year is, is different than any other year because of, of the virus but i'd come by here on a four or five o'clock in the afternoon six o'clock in the afternoon and there was half a dozen cars here and again for a small community um on a weekend there was 10 or 15 cars here and there was 30 or 40 people here on a saturday on a sunday and in, in the evenings and so on like i said there was you know 10 or 15 people here and some people came and, and they would walk the trails and the the the, the Grandmas would bring their grandmas and grandpas would bring their, their little grandkids and or great grandkids. I don't know. Uh, of course, moms and dads would bring their their kids here. And I was like, wow, this is actually being used. I, I'm not artistic at all. Um, so way back in the beginning and even now, when they're talking about things, they give me an idea of what they want. They have to come up with the artistic, um, you know, the, the vision. And then what I try to do is give them the canvas to make their vision come come alive. Yeah, again, I think it shows when you when you have people, like I said, from 20, 30 miles away coming here, you know that it's appreciated. You, you know it's 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 attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, not only the playground equipment, but again, you look around. And art, okay, you can you, art is, is it takes many different forms. Um, you know, I, I look at landscaping as as an art, um, and and I couldn't I couldn't put together what what Linda has done here, and others. It's community involvement. If if you get the people involved, um, where they show interest in helping in whatever way, whatever way. Uh, that, that's that's the, the biggest, by far the biggest asset. Hi, I'm Kim Simons. I'm from Liberty, New York. Right here in Walnut Mountain was my neighborhood. I moved to Jersey for a little while, about 10 years, and now I'm back and I love it. I've been an artist my whole life. I actually been born an artist. Um, for me, everything is a canvas. Anything that you see or look at is a potential piece of artwork. I'm a regular painter, sculptor, I'm a food artist, I'm a cake artist. Whatever you throw at me, I'm going to turn it into art somehow, some way. I write once a month for the River Reporter for Kim's Kitchen. I do a little cute little demo with food, fondant, cookies, something simple so people can follow along. It's a YouTube video as well as all the directions so they can follow along during these times that everyone's stuck home. I believe art is one of the best things out there for mental health, for health alone. Creating and making something beautiful will make you really happy. I love the fact that we have art in public spaces. Art to everybody means something different. Everybody sees the same painting in a different way. Everyone pulls a different emotion from that art. And art makes people happy. I'm so proud to be part of the Sullivan County Dove Trail. It was one of the best things this area has done. It, it let artists show who they are. Multiple, multiple artists get to paint pieces, some two or three on a piece, some by themselves. People absolutely love the Dove Trail. I have no people who come here to visit just for the Dove Trails. We've run across people from England, from Jersey, Connecticut, um, travel just to see the Dove Trail. As an artist, I felt it was important for me to visit every single Dove, so I made it a point. 
And I didn't realize how beautiful Sullivan County is and how enormous it is and how nice the people are and the towns are and how beautiful a lot of the towns are looking. COVID really put everybody back. And um, during this time when you're kind of stuck home and you're not really allowed to be around people, I got really bored and found another blank canvas beside of my house. As I'm painting that piece, I've had people stop by in the car, yell out their window like, thank you so much. You put a smile on my face during these times. Hello, uh, my name is Zach Shaverick. I go by Zach Max. Uh, you guys might recognize my name from the sculptures around Sullivan County, uh, notably the ones in Rock Hill. Uh, there used to be a bunch of Benji and Jake's in White Lake, um, all over the place really, just giant monstrous sculptures that I'm known for. And I think the addition of having these sculptures in Sullivan County adds not just um, the excitement of having something great like that, but also a little bit of edginess, you know, not not every town that you walk into, do you show up and see giant monsters and creations that are just sort of otherworldly and extremely um, whimsical or imaginative like the ones that I produce. And I think public art is something that every town should have, obviously, because it brings life and it brings excitement to whoever sees it. And my work in particular gives it a, uh, a sort of different vibe that when you see this, you have to wonder what's going on over there. And I think that's really cool. And not everyone's gonna like it. A lot of people do like it, a lot of people don't. And that, that controversy is also something that's interesting. You know, you get a dialogue going, you get people uh, discussing it, talking about it. And it really, it can bring a whole identity to a community. It can uh, explain that the community is open-minded or uh, willing to see things in a different light. And coming into these Corona times, I think it's important that public art be uh, reinforced because artists are having more difficulty than ever probably because when the world goes through things such as we're going through right now, it's easy to overlook the importance of art. It's sort of a non-commodity it doesn't it doesn't affect exactly how we live our lives in so much as you don't need it to survive but you do need it to thrive and i think it's important that people recognize that that without art your kind of your culture and your uh your communities will shrivel you know um my art you know people see these giant monsters and they say uh you know what's wrong with that person or what's going on here but i think there there's also like a little joy behind these creatures something whimsical and smiley and maybe they represent your your rough day but they also kind of help you get through it you know the gargoyle on top of the building that protects you so this is also sort of a, a talisman for for the tough times so i hope uh i hope my work can can produce some you know some good vibes and protect the protect the people that see it. One of the central points of tourism, obviously, you know, you go, you see something crazy, you tell your friends about it, and that brings people into a community, to a place where, where there is public art, and people, people want to be around that, you know, it just, it just, it helps create, um, you know, the energy. For me, I like my art to speak to everybody, to the masses, and I think people get to see public art there, they can they can change their whole life because they say, oh, somebody else is out there making art for a living. Maybe I can do that too. Uh, here in Rock Hill, I paint the sculptures about once every two years. And they're, some of them are pretty close to the road, so they are affected by mechanical rusting. That is, when the plows come by and push the snow up against them, it will rust them a little bit faster than anything else. But these are, you know, par for the course. Hi, my name's Allison Capella. I'm the Community Development Program Manager at Sullivan Renaissance. I'm here with Lori Kilgore, a Sullivan County artist who is a public school art teacher. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. 
So we're here to talk about uh, public art in Sullivan County, all different kinds of public art. And Lori has a lot of experience in creating public art. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your first public art uh, sure. installation? Uh, uh, 14 years ago, um, a fellow artist, uh, Toby Magnetico, she's also a, a local artist and an art teacher uh, in Sullivan County. Um, we were approached by uh, someone from the Hurleyville community regarding their uh, museum building, uh, Sullivan County Museum building, and about painting panels and stuff for uh, Renaissance projects, which is kind of like when I first started hearing about it. Um, and we had to put a proposal together. Other artists, it was competitive, trying to uh, get this opportunity. And Toby and I were very fortunate that we got it. And we spent a year uh, designing it and painting it, and it was six panels. Um, we It's grown, but they can currently still be viewed at the Sullivan County Museum. So one of the things I'm hearing that um, I've been reading about different public art uh, installations around the country, and that sounds like you uh, and your fellow artists had to go through, was it takes a lot of community input to yes. to get to these you know final projects and for final products and, you know, you're really building consensus and community and what they wanted. So, um, it's just, it's, it's for, in my, you know, experience and reading about different public art, uh, it seems like really successful ones are when the community is involved and people are behind the project. Yes. Um, and, and they had a clear vision of what they wanted. So, you know, you're getting commissioned for this. So it, it was helpful. We were able to take certain liberties and, and figure out some things ourselves. And as I've done with even projects since then. Um, but it, it is important when you have that community involvement or, or and have those conversations and meetings to make sure everybody's on the same page. Wow, that's, that's awesome. I mean, that's really one of the biggest benefits of public art is that it gets together all different community stakeholders, municipal officials, uh, artists, um, community activists to get together to come behind a project. And that's when it's successful, it sounds like it's just really wonderful. Yeah. And then, and then after a while, you kind of gain a rapport uh, with different communities. So I've been fortunate, too, where sometimes they're like, well, we want this, but just come up with your design and, and we'll roll with it. Not to say roll with it. You still have to give them your proposals and everything has to get approved but it is nice too when they they kind of trust your judgment on certain things give you the basics that you need to, to start working out the design and each time I work with me there's several meetings conversations different drafts that occur um, because you really want to work that out um, before you begin what are some of the other experiences you've had doing uh, public art in Sullivan County? Um, I've uh, done, well, we did more panel, more windows at the museum in Bolivar. Um I uh, got involved with town, different people were doing stuff at the town park. Um, so they had a, part of a garden installation piece. Um, I worked on that on a student, uh, Case, uh, this kid Casey that had gone to one of the school. Um, McManus and uh, he did one panel I did the other ones um, Dillon Park I got involved with that so creating their sign uh, reading in bookstore um, then I also did murals um, throughout Rock Hill in several different stages um, and signs for their farmers market um, I also did a murals in uh, Monticello it's a six panel um, board, four by eight boards that uh, on the side of a building, Monticello, that you can see uh, down Broadway. And then I participated in the Dove Trail project last year. So I have two doves, one on Rock Hill and one uh, at Collins Field, which is on 17B on Woodstock Way um, towards Market Valley. Wow. Um, and I, that's, that's, that's impressive. <laughs> So it keeps me pretty busy. Yeah, on top of your full-time job. And top of my full-time job. <laughs> so one of the things we talked about uh, before, you know, filming this this interview was um, some of the successful longer-term art projects and some that didn't work out so well. And it comes down to uh, using specific materials and learning from uh, what worked and what didn't. And from, you know, our point of view as a funder, a Sullivan Renaissance, we love working with the artists that have experience like you 
with materials that last because when you're looking for funding, you really want to make sure you're funding something that's going to last or that there's a maintenance plan. And so can you talk a little bit about some of the things you've learned and some of the materials and lessons? Yeah. yeah. So um, actually the ones that were the ones uh, that have lasted, they, they have lost some coloring and, but they haven't had major just repair or the murals. And I think that also has to do with the way the light hits the building, the weather, everything. And so all that does factor in. So, you know, even if you had a painting in your home or a photograph in your home, you, you would never put it next to where light was coming in because it would change the coloring. Well, that's the same thing when, when it comes to a painting or, or an outdoor piece. Um, so some, though, locations that pieces have been done are just saturated by sunlight and weather. Um, but you have to use a good quality paint, uh, good sealers. And, and unfortunately, it's trial and error. I've had some that have done great. I'm redoing I'm in the process of redoing two projects, uh, both for the town of Thompson. Um, it was uh, murals that I did four years ago, music murals you can see on the side of the highway. And then um, the garden piece, which has been much longer, maybe eight, nine years, um, for, since I painted that one. And it's just because of, of, the, of the sun, the way it hit it. But they're, um, the ones in Rock Hill that were four years ago, music ones, actually got uh, we think the salt from the highway and it just literally ate the painting, like wow. gouges out of the painting and chips and just things <laughs> you were not. Ex I was not expecting because it was such a large mural. That's so cool. So it's just interesting. What I'm hearing is, you know, how beneficial it is to have a local artist doing these public installations because, you know, you have these relationships with the town. Yeah. So one if uh, you've built relationships like a community activist where when they want to do new murals or other communities, they, they, they know you, they trust you, you're a known commodity, right? you know, so that, and also you're able to come and touch them up again. Yeah. Um, you take pride where you live and it's so cool to see that and hear how you're getting the kids involved and, and that yeah. they take pride in it. And, you know, that's uh, another huge benefit of public art is, it, you know, it's it's an expression of the community. And Absolutely. To hear the kids, you know. Yeah, they get into it. And I had students a couple years ago, this other here for God, over in Rock Hill, when they put in their playground and, and did stuff with their, their firehouse. Um, the kids uh, painted murals and they designed them. Wow. Down Chase. And so it was their first time. And they were silly. They were, they were interesting. It was kind of hard because you had a bunch of kids like collaborate and you're going to work on this little painting together. And But it was really cool. And they took a lot of pride in the fact that it was on the outside of the playground. And again, those, you know, probably need to be redone. But And that maybe that's great for another group of kids coming through because that was quite a few years ago. But they do take a lot of pride and, and they get excited. And, and I get excited too because I am, I've become this muralist painter, which I, is something I didn't really foresee for myself. 